Good morning. My name is Bill Chafe. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and a member of the History Department at Duke University. And we are very pleased to be here this morning uh, to conduct a living history interview uh, with Professor Samuel Du Bois Cook. The Duke University Office for Institutional Equity and the Living History Program are honored to present this interview. It has also been made possible with assistance from the Office of the Provost, the Office of the University Librarian, the Office of the University Secretary, and the Political Science Department. Professor Cook was appointed to the faculty of Duke University in 1966. He was the first African American to serve on Duke's faculty. He left Duke in the winter of 1974 to become president of Dillard University in New Orleans, where he served for 23 years as president, retiring from that position in 1997, in the meantime pursuing a whole series of other activities during those years, including becoming the first African American president of the Southern Political Science Association and a long term of service as a member of the Board of Trustees of Duke University, where he served with great distinction. We are interviewing Professor Cook, President Cook, and I always feel as though Professor always has to come before President, but uh, that's because that's our fundamental vocation. Uh, and we are uh, pleased to have as members of our interviewing panel today uh, Raymond Gavins, uh, Professor of History at Duke University, uh, who has uh, joined the Duke University faculty in 1970. That's uh, and Sheridan Johns, Professor of Political Science, uh, who joined the Department of Political Science faculty in 1971. Is that correct? Actually, 1970. 1970, okay. So we have here a wonderful kind of a combination of uh, people who had the opportunity to share uh, at least some of our period of time at Duke with uh, our, our good colleague, uh, Professor Cook. Uh, uh, and we are wanting to explore with you today uh, uh, Professor Cook, uh, and maybe we can call you Sam if that's okay. Please do. Uh, uh, some of our, some of your experiences, uh, and get a better sense from you of uh, the kinds of activities that have made your life such a significant one for all of us. I want to begin by just asking you to talk a little bit about your personal background, and what were some of the things that shaped uh, your decision uh, and your journey to Morehouse. Oh. <coughs> I was born in Griffin, Georgia, a small town about 35 miles south of Atlanta. Uh, the son of a Baptist minister, and in fact, uh, my father was a Baptist minister, my grandfather, my great grandfather. I have two brothers who are ministers, I have two uncles who are ministers. In fact, uh, when I went to Moore House in 1944 as a freshman, Everyone assumed that I was going to be a minister. So I was listed in the school of religion. Uh, but uh, my father and my family were very close to Morehouse. A good school right down the road, right up the road rather, from Griffin. And the acting president of Morehouse, Dr. Charles Du Bois Hubert, after whom I was named, was a very good friend of my father's. Big man, used to quote Shakespeare, come to Griffin and speak. And so I wanted to go to Morehouse, but I'd had a brother who'd gone to Morehouse before me and who'd done quite well. And I had met a, a man who had a tremendous influence on my life. In fact, he still has great influence on my life. That's Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays, uh, who's a great soul. And I'll be saying more about him uh, as this interview proceeds. But I met him when I was a sophomore in high school. And I met him on the tobacco farm in Connecticut. I was so impressed with Dr. Mays that I went back and I read uh, two or three of his books, uh, The Negro's God, The Negro's Church, and so forth. And I was influenced by him way down in high school. So it was just written that I was going to Morehouse. And the only school that I aspired to attend was Morehouse. The only one I applied to was Morehouse College. It was just a natural for me. And you know, when I went back for my 40th reunion uh, 10 years ago, it's the first time the thought occurred to me, what would have happened had Morehouse turned me down? <laughs> but it never occurred to me. I just knew I was going to be a Morehouse man. I just knew it and so forth. So I, I went to Morehouse because of this family association because of Dr. Mays, uh, Dean Brazil, and others whom I had met when I was way down in high school. Mm -hmm. And where did you study at Morehouse? 
I studied uh, philosophy and, I hate to say it, history, but really I was a history major. <laughs> Uh, and I had thought of being a historian because at that time, Mohawk did not have a political science department. Mm -hmm. So I had uh, philosophy and history and I had a mind in economics. But I had a brother who had preceded me and who had finished Mohawk in 1942, who was a history major. He later became a very distinguished theologian and so forth. But I was a history major so I have, that's my skeleton in the closet. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Well, we are proud to call you, <laughs> call, call you our, our brother in arms <laughs> in the historical profession. Yeah. How did we political scientists claim you? Because presumably you went to Ohio State to do political science, or did you start out there to do history? Mm -hmm. And combined with that, what made you think about going so far away from Atlanta and from Georgia, where your roots were so deep? Yeah, uh, good question. Actually, when I finished uh, Morehouse, I had a scholarship to the University of Michigan Law School. And I had thought of going to law school. Uh, however, my father died during my junior year uh, at Morehouse. Well, I was a rising senior uh, that summer in August. My father died. And I had a young brother coming along. So I knew I couldn't spend three years in school, so I decided to spend one year and get a master's degree. Uh, and then help my brother get a job and help my brother, my kid brother, go to college. Because my brother helped me and my sister had helped me and my dad had died. So I decided to go into political science at Ohio State. I'd worked in the steel mills in Youngstown, Ohio. I had an uncle who lived there. And I, for several summers, I worked in the steel mills. In fact, one summer I had two jobs in the steam, eight hours a day. At, uh, I went to one at seven and the other one at four and uh, to work. I, I had to work and I was grateful for the opportunity. Uh, so I decided to go uh, to Ohio State because I had a lot of friends uh, from Youngstown who worked in the steel with me who had gone to Ohio State. So I decided to go to Ohio State. In addition to which, being a resident for the summer, I could uh, apply and get remission of my fees, my tuition. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went to uh, Ohio State. I applied for admission and I got in, uh, luckily. And when I started in political science there, a whole new world opened to me. I'd had a couple of courses in political philosophy on the distinguished philosophy at Mohawk. But I came under the influence of people like David Spitz, uh, Harry Jaffa, uh, Lou Dempsey, and so forth. They took a great interest in me. Uh, David Spitz became my great mentor and my idol. I always wanted to be like David Spitz. He was an eminent political philosopher. But he took me under his wings. And I, I started to grapple with ideas in political philosophy. And he taught me to feel at home in the broad sweep of political philosophy. Uh, ancient and medieval political philosophy, contemporary and so forth. And he himself has studied on the great philosopher Morris R. Cohen at City College in, in New York. The son of Robin McKeever, who himself was a great social and political philosopher. So this whole new world opened to me. And then I decided, I said, gee, this is what I want to do. I want to be a scholar and I want to uh, become a political scientist, I want to be a teacher. And I abandoned the whole idea of going to law school. In fact, it would have been a disaster had I gone to law school because uh, I can't imagine anything more boring uh, than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I got my master's and I was so excited. I got a university scholarship and I got a part-time job, waiting tables and so forth. So I was just excited. And of course, I went straight through for my doctorate. Uh, meantime, because of my scholarships and because of my jobs, I was able to assist my younger brother to go to college. So I was able to accomplish uh, both major objectives. And that's how I got into political science, and that's how I became an educator, more or less, well, through accident in large part. 
Dr. Mays must have arrived at Morehouse maybe your sophomore or junior, 45 or so. No, Dr. Mays arrived in 1940, July 1, mm -hmm. uh, 1940, so he was there. Mm -hmm. so, and he'd been my uh, brother dean at the Howard University School of Religion. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah. You referred to him last night in your, in your lecture. I wonder if, if you could tell us a little more about uh, how he shaped your your, I mean, the values that you shared with us last night, how, how Dr. Mays, it, his weekly chapel talks, uh, that sort of thing, are these things that we hear about him, uh, things that you experienced? Oh, yes. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Mays would always speak in chapel. We had uh, compulsory chapel. We didn't think of it as compulsory, but it was six days a week. On the day we had off from chapel, uh, was on Saturday. So we went uh, six days uh, six days uh, a week, including Sunday. Dr. Mays was a national figure, as you well know, in fact, international figure. Traveled all over the world, all over the country. But every, every Tuesday, he was in that chapel uh, speaking. He had a tremendous impact among students. That day we would not miss chapel. In fact, a friend of mine, Bob Chirag, whom you perhaps know, said that even pagans sat in the window to hear Bitter Mays on Tuesday morning. <laughs> he would walk the floor. He was an inspiring speaker, tall, handsome, dark skinned, with a shock of gray hair right there, so impressive. And he worked hard on his speeches. He never took uh, them for granted. But he would, we would say, Buck Benny rides again, and he got standing ovation for his ideas. But the thing that came through in, uh, in those chapel addresses, the thing, one, his commitment to excellence. He taught us to be intolerant of mediocrity. Always strive for excellence, the higher possibilities. He taught us uh, more deeply, always aim high. He would just have that great passion, always reach for the stars. You know, never have low aim, always aspire to number thing. He taught us always to have integrity. And this has been uh, quite influential in my life. Uh, uh, always, he said, never sell your soul. No matter what, you know, die, Unmourn, die unknown, die poor, but never sell your soul. That was instilled in me and reinforced uh, uh, the, the teaching that I learned from my parents in Griffin, Georgia. My dad had ministered and so forth. The, uh, Dr. Mays had the intellectual ground that my father, of course, did not have. My father had the intuitive wisdom and the integrity and so forth. But Dr. Mays said, never, never, never sell your soul. And later, when we became colleagues and I became a young professor at Lang University, we developed a great, great, great friendship. And I'll say more about that uh, later. Uh, but uh, in terms of influencing me and this integrity, I, I, I said to him, uh, you know, you talk about you never sell your soul. There are so many ways to sell your soul, insidious influences. And typically, Bitter May said to me, I didn't tell you all that because I wanted you to figure out something for yourself and so forth. That. But striving for excellence, have integrity, always aim high, always work hard. He, one of his favorite phrases was, you got to burn the midnight oil. You got to burn, you got to work hard. Yeah. And I suppose the, the, the greatest influence that Dr. Mays had on me and on others at Mohawk was he convinced us that he cared deeply about us, that, 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 he, that he loved us. And he disclosed to us something about how your possibilities, what we could become, what we could make of our lives through hard work, and through integrity, through discipline, through self-sacrifice. And he convinced us and because he himself had achieved so much and his background was one of poverty in South Carolina on a farm, 
In fact, Dr. Mays himself uh, did not finish high school until he was 21. Had to work on the farm. And in South Carolina, he worked, he went to school only three months out of a year. His mother couldn't read or write. And his father, um, though had a little education, had almost contemporary education. Didn't want to help him. In fact, told Dr. Mays that he, uh, that going to school was wasting his time and his energy. And he didn't support him. And Dr. May went on to school anyway, defying, defying his father and, and so forth. So he had a tough background. And because he had achieved so much, uh, we knew we could achieve if we followed his advice. But he, he, he cared. He, he, was a, he was a tough man. He was a hard taskmaster. Uh, he would come down hard on us. He would meet with us. And we would get in some difficulty. He would encourage us to argue with him. And he would knock us down. I mean, his man of rigorous logic. He'd knock us down on the floor. But he wouldn't, when he would knock us down, one always got the feeling that he was pulling for it. He was saying, get off the floor like a champion and come back swinging. Mm -hmm. uh, so he encouraged us to be tough-minded, to be analytical, to be logical, to be rigorous and to ask no quarters and to give no quarters, uh, that kind of thing. So all these things I think I learned from, from, from Bailey Mays uh, and so forth. It's, 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 it's you know, he, he, he made me us get a preview of, all, of our own lives so if we followed the advice. So that's why you went back to Atlanta to Atlanta University to be near Billy Mays? Probably <laughs> that wasn't the only reason, but what drew you back there? Were there other opportunities or? Uh, yeah, well, when I, uh, I got my doctorate, and I had, uh, I was uh, blessed, I was lucky enough, uh, well, at that time I, had, I didn't have my doctorate, really. I was getting my doctorate, uh, and uh, I was in the first group of, uh, sponsored by the American Political Science Association, called Congressional Interns by which we would go to Washington and spend six months with a congressman and six months with a senator. I was all excited about that possibility and so forth, and, and the first group of 10 in the whole country, so I was all excited. And then I was offered a position as assistant professor of political science at Dillon University of New Orleans. <laughs> And uh, Dr. Dent, who was then the distinguished president of uh, Dillon University, uh, was very interested in having me come there. Meantime, I was trying to finish my dissertation. I came home one day from the Library of Congress, where I had met John Hope Franklin. Well, I'd seen him again. We, were, we shared the desk next to each other, the Library of Congress. And I got this letter, greetings from the President of the United States. My induction papers were in the Army. Uh, Dr. Dan tried to convince uh, General Hershey uh, that my uh, coming to Dillard was in the national interest and so forth, one of the few battles Dr. Dent lost. So I went into the Army and spent a couple of years, and great experience in the Army and so forth. That was 1953, October. And I got out in 55. Meantime, I completed my degree, my PhD, my dissertation, while in the Army. I go to my office at night and uh, study and write. In fact, I gave myself a seminar on Aristotle and this, that, and other. So I finished my dissertation and got my PhD in 1954. Then when I got out of the Army, I rode around while stealing the army in anticipation of getting out. I got about 14 offers of position in uh, predominantly black schools. And uh, I went to Southern University in, in Baton Rouge and stayed there uh, one year. And it so happened that uh, the chair of the Department of Political Science at Atlanta University died. I planned to stay at Southern. I loved the place. Uh, but Dr. Boyd died, and I was offered the position of chairman of the policy department at Atlanta University. 
So I went to Atlanta. It was purely accidental. But what a great joy it was to get back to Atlanta mm -hmm. and to be uh, around there with Dr. Mays and others. And actually, I, my office was in the same building where Dr. Mays' office was uh, in the Atlanta University Hogwarts Hall. So his office was right down the hall from mine. And many times I would go to my office at night as a young professor working. Keep in the middle of that hall. Wait a minute. Uh, but this man, Benjamin Elijah May, was down the hall working too <laughs> when he was in town. <laughs> so we developed this, 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 this great thing. But that's how I got to Atlanta University, it purely, it purely accidentally. Yeah. Sam, can I take you back to Morehouse for a second uh, yeah. uh, before you uh, go off to Ohio State? And, uh, Tell us about how large your class was and uh, some of the other people you, were, you met there and, and how Morehouse was as a place to deal with the, uh, as a base for dealing with the post-World War II discussions and intensity about uh, changing race relations in, in, in the United States. Well, Morehouse is very small. I guess when I went there as a freshman, it was during the war, and I was an early admission student. I was 15 when I went to Morehouse. Um, the war was going on, and Dr. Mays uh, felt that he had to have a new system to, have, to keep Morehouse open, a new system of admission. So he developed a program to admit youngsters who he thought were able and could make it at Morehouse. So I was in that, in that group, and uh, along with uh, another individual, some others whom I mentioned in, in the second. But Moans is very small. Uh, I suppose we had about 300, uh, maybe 400 students when, mm -hmm. I, when I went there, very small. Classes were very small. Mm -hmm. I think tuition was, this is hard to believe, uh, $60 a semester, mm -hmm. 120 a year, mm -hmm. and so forth. And it was, uh, wasn't easy for many of us to, to go there, mm -hmm. and so we had, had, we had, we had work. Um, among the early mission people, in fact, in my own class, was, as you know, uh, Bill uh, Shea, Martin Luther King, Jr. He was an early mission one, too, and he was uh, 15 uh, well, when, he, when he went there and so forth. But uh, among the other students uh, there, uh, I mentioned Dr. King, also, Child of Eric Willie, who's now a professor at Harvard, distinguished mm -hmm. sociologist, uh, Arthur Johnson, uh, who was vice president at Wayne State, Jerome Bennett, Jr., executive editor of uh, Ebony Magazine, and so forth. Bob Johnson, who died last year, two years ago, who was the uh, executive editor of, of Jet Magazine. Just a whole variety mm -hmm. of people. It's amazing uh, how much talent uh, was developed at that small place. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, Floyd McKissing was there for a couple of years during my, during my time generation. But in terms of uh, what you said about the, in preparation of the post-war world and race relations, Dr. Mays is one of the leaders in social change in the South mm -hmm. and change in race relations. He was one of the founders of the old um, Interracial Council on Goodwill, out of which grew the Southern Regional Council. Uh, and the uh, man, for, on, he wrote a book on him and so forth, very close to Dr. Mays, mm -hmm. as you well, okay, well know. But Dr. Mays was a man who believed in universal brotherhood. He was a vigorous, prophetic, courageous for racism, segregation. And he came down hard on it, way back in the 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. He was uncompromising. In fact, you read some of his speeches now, and uh, they would be militant in the sense of uh, real, simple, direct, uncompromising social justice. Mm -hmm. But he was uncompromising on it, and he influenced a lot of people. And I said to Dr. Mays later, and we became friends in Atlanta. Dr. Mays, how'd you get away with it? I said, you gave speech way back in the 30s and 40s, which would be, I know they're considered radical. In fact, you know, he was accused of being a communist and all this kind of thing. How'd you get away with it? And Dr. Mays uh, looked at me and he said, Sam, and I have forgotten this. 
when people think you are sincere, they will forgive you for a lot of things. <laughs> he said, they thought I was sincere. In this <laughs> but he was uncompromising. And he influenced a whole lot of people, Ralph McGill, uh, Terry Sanford, when Terry Sanford was a student at the University of North Carolina, he came under Dr. May's influence and so mm -hmm. forth. He's a great mm -hmm. friend of Frank Graham and so forth. And I remember a lady uh, who lived in Chapel Hill uh, named Ann Queen who said mm -hmm. to me that Dr. May gave me a social conscience and he gave a lot of people a social conscience. And he was able to develop the moral appeal in terms of human justice and social rights in the tradition of the prophets uh, and Jesus of Nazareth in, in particular. Uh, and he intellectually and with his commitment to the social gospel, uh, people like uh, Walter Rauschenbusch and Ron O. Niebuhr, Emma Bruner, uh, one of his great professors at Chicago, Henry Nelson Wyman, uh, who's one of the two persons on uh, whose concept of God that uh, Martin Luther King dealt with at Boston University. Uh, he, he dealt with the comparison of the concept of God and Henry Nelson um, uh, Wyman and Paul Tillich. Uh, and uh, Dr. Mays has studied under Henry Nelson mm -hmm. Wyman at Chicago and so forth. But Dr. Mays was uncompromising and he developed this philosophy on terms of human justice and race relations. So he prepared the seed uh, in a sense of revolution. He, he, Martin Luther King Jr. called him his spiritual advisor, spiritual mentor and so forth. But Dr. May was so, he, he really believed in brotherhood and social justice. And he created an environment at Morehouse where you had to rebel against injustice. You just had to. In fact, the title of his autobiography was, uh, 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 is, uh, uh, rather, Rebellion Against Injustice and so forth. Born, he called it, we are born to rebel mm -hmm. about uh, injustice and so forth. Mm. But this was, this was the kind of atmosphere in which uh, so many individuals at Morehouse uh, cut their teeth in terms mm -hmm. of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, Martin Luther King Jr. obviously was the, was the greatest one and so forth. Yeah. But a great cohort. Mm -hmm. What, yes, a, what a band of warriors. <laughs> Then you arrive back in 55 at Atlanta University. 56. 56, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One year, after one year at Southern. One year at Southern. And what had changed from that atmosphere that you'd experienced as a student, other than that you were sitting on the other side of the desk, but was the atmosphere different, almost not quite 10 years later, but almost a decade later from when you'd been there as a student? Uh, yeah, things had changed so what in 56 in my, my student year. Of course, it's a, being a professor, that's yeah. uh, one thing, yeah. status and so forth. And it's quite interesting. That's an interesting question. So many individuals there were my former professors, and they had taught me and so forth. And uh, here I was, a young Turk, uh, uh, <laughs> on their own, not pretty independent, and you know, aspiring and didn't have the proper deference for a lot of people <laughs> and it upset uh, Mrs. Mays who was just a wonderful young spirit. I <coughs> asked no quarters and so I was very critical of some of the people, some of my professors and Mrs. Mays talked to me, she used to call me Cookie <laughs> and she said, Cookie Give a little to age. <laughs> <laughs> give a little to age, sir. So he was kind of talking about how you act what you say and how critical and this, that, and everything else. Just, just give a little to age. And this, that, and that. Well, I said, uh, Mrs. Bayes, I don't see any necessary relation between age and wisdom, or this, that, and the other, or correctness. And she said, Cookie, give a little to age. Now I can appreciate what you're saying. You have a little age and so forth. But uh, most of my ex-professors uh, were just wonderful with me. We had a great relationship. 
I developed a town meeting program at Atlanta University where we would have uh, what I call the Socratic Dialogue. And we would have students and faculty participate in the program. We had great individuals, uh, Dr. Mays was on that. After 1961, the uh, initial speaker on the program, one of them would always be Martin Luther King, Jr. Had uh, people like Ralph McGill, Eugene Patterson. You know, Eugene Patterson would appear on the program. Didn't have any money to, to pay in them, so they did it gratis. And we would have these great debates. Uh, two adults and two students on each program. And they were really exciting. I, I think it's one of the real important things I've done in my life. Uh, life of the dialogue, we call it. And we would have these great sessions in Sage Hall Chapel at Atlanta, uh, Atlanta University and debate great issues. We had Horace Mann Bond, Judy Bond's father, to mm -hmm. speak on that. And after that, we would um, have a post-mortem at our house, uh, invite us to like the people, continue the discussion. And it just had a lot of fun, the excitement of life of the mind. You know, uh, a university ought to be the most exciting place in the whole world. It's just, just, just a wonderful life of the mind, the challenge, the, the sense of wonder involved in exploration of ideas, the dreaming. Just, just an exciting place, really. And in one of these post-mortems uh, of our town meeting, uh, had the striking experience of introducing two of the most famous people in the world. They never met each other. Les Dunbar, you know Les Dunbar, mm -hmm. uh, who's now in Durham. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Les Dunbar at that time was the uh, executive director of the Southern Regional Council. And Les would be on our program too. So I was talking to Les Dunbar about some people we should uh, uh, invite to our house after the uh, town meeting that uh, is coming up. And Les Dunbar said to me, he said, Sam, so you know, Two of the most famous people in the world are right here in Atlanta, and they have never met. So I said, Martin Luther King Jr., and who else? <laughs> <laughs> he said, Ralph McGill. Well, mm -hmm. Ralph McGill is a great friend of ours. He won the Pulitzer Prize and so forth. And he had a deliberate policy of not getting too close to people of influence and power. He couldn't write about them objectively and so forth. But anyway, I said, uh, I'm going to invite him. So Martin Luther King Jr. was speaking on it. So I invited Ralph McGill to the house. And I should never forget Ralph McGill and Martin Luther King Jr. meeting in our living room on Beckwith Street in Atlanta. They met in the center and the talk and went into my study and talked for two hours. They became fast friends. And they became friends until Dr. King's assassination and so forth in, in 68. So, but they met in our home. Now, had I had a sense of history, I would have had a camera. I got <laughs> <laughs> you know, you take all these things for granted and, 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 and so forth. But that town meeting I had at Atlanta University was really a, a, an exciting thing. Mm -hmm. And I had, we had one, uh, uh, one subject uh, uh, one month on what can students do to make the world better? Now, this was in the late 50s. And no one came with the idea of sitting in the thing like that, that is, uh, like that. Had two faculty members and two students. No one came with the idea. But what can students do to make the world better? As a, as a segue uh, from there uh, toward Duke, um, without going too far into the Atlanta student movement, um, and I'm sure you were on the scene at that 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 event at Richards when Martin Luther King Jr. was was arrested. But can you can you give us a sense of the intensity of those years uh, for the campus and the community, uh, the sit-ins, uh, the demonstrations, uh, student activism? Uh, many of your own students, I'm sure, were involved. Uh, Julian Bond. I'm, I'm not sure if Vernon Jordan was in all that, but the activism of those years. Oh, yes, well, uh, with the uh, sit-in in Greenboro, I guess it's 61, I think it was, 
um, the Atlanta group wanted to be somewhat uh, independent and they said, uh, what we do, we're going to develop our own uh, program. And so they, uh, they met with the presidents and they published in the Atlanta Constitution Journal an appeal for human rights where they provide the philosophical justification for social change and all that. And the Atlanta student movement, of course, uh, uh, was involved in all kinds of activities, the, the demonstration, the sit-ins and all that, went to jail, the, the whole works and so forth. But there was a great deal of, great deal of excitement uh, uh, in Atlanta and uh, uh, throughout the South. Um, uh, they met with uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and Raleigh Shaw University to collaborate on some strategies of, of change. The uh, young people were excited, and many of them were so so impatient, uh, you know, with the pace of change. Uh, some of them were very critical of Dr. Dr. King and so forth. But the the demonstrations were an exciting thing, and they were intensive. And I should never forget, I was down at the railroad station. Uh, one day when they, have it, they were having a demonstration, and uh, one uh, white person said, man, said they have uh, those in every place. They're over there, they're over here, that's all over Atlanta in terms of demonstration and so forth. Uh, but it was a great, uh, you know, a great period of, of commitment. and. Um, some of these students like Lonnie King and Julian Bond, mm -hmm. John Lewis, and all of them have become great national figures and, and so forth. But the, the commitment they had to a better life, the social change, the kind of dignity they had, were just, 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 just inspiring. I guess there was a long tradition, both in the Atlanta University Center at Morehouse and other schools, of professors actually uh, being involved. You must have overlapped with Clarence Baycoat and uh, uh, Bob Brisbane and those people. Um, uh, when, when, when you were a, uh, on the faculty at Atlanta University, did you feel that you were supported in this kind of activism from the administration uh, to be involved uh, in uh, social change activities, downtown demonstrations, and so on? Well, on, on the whole, yes, yeah, supported. Uh, Dr. Mays, of course, was enthusiastic. Uh, Dr. Clement, who was president of Atlanta University, uh, was more, was more of a moderate, mm -hmm. uh, you're well known. And he was on the Atlanta School Board, so that obviously created certain constraints on, on him, at least he thought they did anyway. And the other presidents of Atlanta University Center on the whole were very, very supportive. Uh, uh, you know, we had some who were more conservative than others. Um, but on the whole, uh, uh, very supportive. Uh, you mentioned Dr. Baycoat, who was the longtime chair of the Department of History at Atlanta University, and just, just a great individual. In fact, the, I was at visiting him uh, uh, in the hospital at Emory University the night he died and so forth. His wife was the last person to talk to him and so forth. Great individual, very, very supportive. You mentioned Dr. Brisbane. I went to his funeral just two weeks ago. He, you know, he died and so forth. But he was obviously very supportive of Dr. Barr and all of them. All those people have been very much involved uh, in politics and social change in, in Atlanta. Now, of course, the younger professors, uh, people who are my age, were enthusiastic, like Howard Zinn. Oh, you know Howard Zinn uh, uh, and his cohorts. Mm -hmm. So we had a little, uh, we had a coterie of uh, young professors, young Turks, just all over the place. Uh, some of the older professors were not, uh, uh, it's understandable, mm -hmm. uh, they're not quite uh, excited about what we were doing. Uh, we were uh, participating, we were demonstrating, we were giving advice, that's uh, just, just, just a couple of things. But I, uh, you know, I, I recall, at Lang University in particular, when the movement turned inward, 
and they wanted to bring about some changes, institutional changes. Uh, that was the most difficult part, the demonstration to bring about changes at the institution. Mm -hmm. You could get unity when it came to fighting racism, institutional racism, opening restaurants and hotels and streetcars and all that kind of business. But when it came to change, institutional change, that's a different ball game altogether. And that's when the, when the rub came in. And that's when I think I, I, uh, I was most effective. Um, I remember, remember at Atlanta University, students were, went to the president's house and threw food on the ground and so forth. And I talked to my own students in political science. And I told them, you, you want to destroy the wrong, not the man. Mm -hmm. I said, you don't want to go to his house and, you know, mm -hmm. upset his wife and his family or, or throw food around the lawn. That, that's not the way to do it. Uh, you want to have dignity and reason. You want to be decent about these things. Your means are just as important as the end, the message that we try to get over to them. I don't think it works for the most part. Sam, uh, what church did you go to in Atlanta? I was a member of uh, Friendship Baptist Church, mm -hmm. uh, young, historic church, uh, pastored by uh, Dr. Yara Carter, uh, then uh, Maynard Jackson's father pastored mm -hmm. that church, and then my major professor, uh, Sam Wade in philosophy, pastored that church mm -hmm. until he died. But I went to Friendship Baptist Church, which was uh, not your typical Baptist church. It was a uh, high level, very sophisticated. In fact, they said, you don't say amen in this church. And so some sister came in one Sunday morning from another church uh, and said, amen. There she said, what did you say? Say amen. Say, well, where did you get that? You didn't get it in this church and so forth. But it was just a highly intellectual church and so forth. It's not one, it's not one of these mass churches like some of the others uh, and so forth, yeah. How did it compare with Ebenezer? Ebenezer is much more mass oriented, much more uh, evangelical, really much more, much more, much more spiritual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, at that time, uh, Daddy King was pastor, and in, starting in 61, uh, M.L. was a co-pastor with him. Uh, but it was a church of great spiritual depth, but a mass church. I mean, you know, M.L. preached, Daddy King preached mm -hmm. the gospel. You know, it's interesting you would raise that question because uh, uh, we're back in Atlanta now. We jump a, a couple of, you know, 20 years, 25 years and so forth. And uh, Ebenezer now has a pastor, Joseph Roberts, who is very good, one of the most exciting preachers in, in, in the whole country. And it still maintains this tradition, this mass base. And it's really an, an exciting church. Mm -hmm. for but Ebenezer, like uh, Wheat Street, mm -hmm. yeah, mass church, very much involved in social change, had a deep social consciousness. That's it. Uh, as more of the ordinary individual. Mm -hmm. uh, friendship had a lot of professional doctors, lawyers, PhDs, and all that. Mm -hmm. And that's still the case. It, it's amazing how these things are perpetuated mm -hmm. down, mm -hmm. down through the years. So it's much the same as it was 25 years ago. Interesting. I wonder if you could go back to the Atlanta University campus and tell us something about the students, because certainly at Atlanta University, this is the graduate school of the complex. You had PhD students there. Indeed, some of your PhD students are still active, as I understand it, uh, today. Could you tell us something about undergraduates? Did you teach them, and more particularly about the graduate students? Oh, yes, uh, of course, I, I taught both graduates and undergraduates. Atlanta University is a purely graduate, yeah. and I was on the graduate faculty of Atlanta University. But undergraduates took my courses, many of them. And I had some very, very uh, 
a good undergraduate student in that class. Uh, for example, Marion Wright Eagleman was in my class, took almost every class that I, that I taught at Atlanta University. Mm -hmm. uh, Lonnie King, who was one of the uh, moves in the student nonviolent uh, movement and so forth, all of them took my class. But in terms of the graduate school, I had some really outstanding students who became uh, outstanding scholars. Uh, for example, Haynes Walton, Jr., who has written a dozen books, and he was a uh, distinguished professor at the University of, of Michigan, yeah. but who taught 25 years at Savannah State College. So, uh, C. Vernon Gray, another one, outstanding political scientist at Morgan State University that uh, I taught. And, uh, there were numerous other ones. I don't want to go into the name, but Haynes Walton is, Walton is perhaps the most mm -hmm. distinguished one. So, mm -hmm. But we used to have one of the most exciting things at Atlanta University. We used to have a, a seminar every Monday involving the faculty and students uh, in the social sciences, political science, history, sociology, and so forth. And we would have all these exchanges, these dialogues, these encounters, really. Really, an exciting place. But I, I think at Atlanta University, I had a small group of students in political science. And I think I did my best job of teaching uh, there. A small group. We had um, a commonality of interest. Uh, we would meet. One time I even gave a seminar had once a seminar on Ron Honeybour. And I had one student in that seminar, but one of the finest seminars I've ever had. Mm -hmm. She was very bright. He would read The Nation, That's the Man, one week, come back and we would discuss it. He'd read the second drama of history, we'd come back and discuss it, you know. He'd read Beyond Tragedy and we'd come away. So it was really that exciting and, and exciting time. I think I did my best job of, of teaching. Mm -hmm. And one of the, uh, as you know, all of you know, one of the great rewards, greatest rewards of, of teaching is to see your students excel, see them soar, mm -hmm. and express gratitude to you for the impact you had on their lives. Mm -hmm. and, you know, teaching is just a, as a noble cause, it's, it's a divine enterprise. Uh, Morris R. Coyne said that Teaching is really the priesthood of the intellect, the priesthood, and he's right about it. It's so rewarding. But to see my, my students soar, to see them have an impact, see them write, see them teach, see them just a, a joy beyond price, mm -hmm. it's just so deep. I also wasn't last, uh, there's a young man, I think in political science, he had a man named Orr, and introduced himself. Mm -hmm. and he was Hayne Walton, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. student at yeah. Savannah State College. Mm -hmm. And he said, you wrote me a letter uh, when I came to Duke, and you said that I am your intellectual grandson. Mm -hmm. And which I, I said, yes, I did. I remember that and so forth, because I had taught Hayne Walton, how mm -hmm. Hayne Walton taught him. And uh, these students are a great inspiration to me now. I get great letters from Hayne Walton and other mm -hmm. former students and they express gratitude to me. And uh, you know, it adds a great deal in, in my harvest years. Mm -hmm. uh, when my students think this, I had a retirement gang. But last you, year from Delta Punk. You were at Atlanta, it was so exciting, so engaging, you were so engaged. Mm -hmm. How could you think about the possibility of leaving? I did. I thought I would retire at Atlanta University. It was a, a great institution. I had outstanding students. I was there. Mohaus was had a continuous campus, Belmont, and all of them, and so forth. I had not planned to leave. Uh, you're really getting into a sensitive area here. <laughs> <laughs> And I see my friend Bill Chase laughing <laughs> because I think he thought it was part of what's coming up. Uh, my coming to Duke in, in part was, uh, was accidental. Um, 
you might read the Sousa's book, you know, he has a, on liberal education, he has a section there, and he mentioned how I got to Duke under the Affirmative Action. That isn't true at all. Um, I delivered a paper at a meeting of the Southern Political Science Association in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. It had to have been in 1965, I guess it was. And it was on the foundations of political obligation. It was a, involved a panel of political philosophy. After I finished my paper, a tall, silver-haired man walked up to me and said, so this is a very good paper. I enjoyed it uh, uh, very much, and, and so forth. So, uh, it was very good. I said, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. What's your name? And he said, I'm John Hallowell. I almost flipped. <laughs> <laughs> because John Hallowell was the most distinguished political philosopher in the country. I had read his books as a graduate student, read his articles. And it even used him because he, my dissertation at Ohio State was on the ethical foundation of democracy. And I had used arguments from John Hallowell against my major professor, David Spitz, who said he was the atheist, but you know, it's one of the great things about Spitz, he allowed me to differ with him and argue differently. He encouraged me with that. I argued uh, in terms of ethics and democracy and Christianity and democracy and so forth. And David Spitz, oh, different, this and that. But I knew John Hallowell. Mm -hmm. So here I am, a young professor, delivering a paper at the Southern Political Science Association. And this distinguished scholar walks up to me. And he said, you know what? I said, um, uh, you might, uh, you know, we might, you know, I should have do. I paid no attention. Got back and John Halloway wrote me a letter. And invited me to come to Duke one semester as a visiting professor. With a, with a visiting associate professor. And uh, I went to the president of Atlanta University and asked for a leave. He said, we well, be fine. So it'd be good for Duke, it'd be good for Atlanta University, it'd be good for you. He sent me to the dean. And the dean said the same thing. And so I said, fine. So I wrote uh, John after a while. And I was very reluctant, uh, really. He wrote me a couple of letters. Why don't you answer my letter, Mr. Stand up? I want to get through. So I wrote then and said, you know, I'd be glad to accept the appointment for one semester. And that summer, so we were, we were all set to come to, uh, come to Duke for one semester. And I'd been teaching, I taught that summer at UCLA. And then the president of my university reversed himself and said, I could not get the leave, which he promised. And this is obviously very painful and so forth. So I said, well, Mr. President, I said, you, you promised me to leave. I have it in writing. You said it'd be good for uh, Atlanta University, good for Duke, good for myself, and this and that and so forth. So he said to me, uh, we got to have continuity in the department and so forth. And so I said, I understand that, but I got a good replacement and so forth. And I, I, so we negotiated. All that summer, we exchanged letters and so forth. So when I got back uh, uh, that September, early September, no, August, and so forth, I saw the president, and he saw me in the hall. It's also almost directly across from me. And he said to me, uh, what are you going to do? You coming back to Atlanta University? Yeah. We need you. I said, Mr. President, uh, I discussed this with you. I talked to the dean also. He told him the same thing. And you said it'd be good for Duke, it'd be good for Atlanta University, good for me, and you gave me a leave and this, that, and other. And I agreed to go to Duke. And I said, based on my own integrity, I don't have any choice. I got to go 
to do. And I said, I hope you approve. This president, who was a very distinguished educator and a historian, by the way, uh, I got a Negro your American historian, <laughs> <laughs> said to me, the next thing he said to me was, when do I get your house? <laughs> when do I get your office? So I said to him, Mr. President, I said, uh, you can get in my office uh, next couple of days. I said, when you get in my house, I'll let you know this afternoon. I said, I got to talk to my wife and we got to make arrangements and so forth. <clears throat> uh, so I talked to my wife and this one of her, she was really at her best. She was very poised, very calm about it. And she said, I'll make the arrangements. So she all around the moving places and so forth, and got seven moving company, and she made arrangements when we could, you know, the funds could be moved, and this, that, and, other and so forth. It's really it's one of the most sparkling moments of our marriage, so she handled all of that. So I went back to, uh, went back to the president the afternoon. I said, President, you can get your house, I think, on Tuesday of next week. We can move. So I, I came to, to Duke, and really, I didn't have a job to suck the best. <laughs> didn't make his integrity. So, you know, I told him, Dr. May, sometimes I, I hate to date that mess <laughs> as much as I love you. <laughs> this bit of integrity is getting me all kind of difficult. But I had to do it to be able So I came to Duke, <clears throat> and I told John Hallowell, I said, uh, you know, I. And say I resigned to Atlanta University. <laughs> the president revoked my leave and so forth. Uh, he go back and this and other. So John didn't say much. But you know what's it's, it's interesting? Joe Fleischman told Vernon Jordan, and I don't think he had his base. I said, "Look, Duke is not going to let Sam Cook get away. He, he's too good. He's going to keep him." Said, you know. That's what's going to happen. He's not coming back to Langley because he didn't know about what had happened and so forth. So uh, John Hallowell worked it out, uh, whereby I could teach part time uh, that uh, second semester, and then I got the offer uh, with tenure to remain at, at Duke. Because that's how I that's how I got to Duke. So that's a peculiar combination of circumstances. So I had not planned to leave Langley. You weren't actively looking for any other offers. I was, I was, <laughs> I was, I was. <laughs> well, that's a that's a great uh, mm -hmm. moment for us, I think, to wrap up the first part of this of this discussion, Sam, because we we've we've had this great journey with you so far, uh, and had to learn a great deal about your experiences at, at Morehouse and in Georgia and in Ohio, and and uh, we're delighted to finally have you here at Duke, uh, and we're going to break at this point and come back in a few minutes and and, and resume our talking with you about. Uh, the Duke part of your experience and then move on to your experience at Dilly. Yeah. So we'll, we'll take a break now for a few minutes. We're back with President Samuel Du Bois Cook from Dillard University and Duke University and we had just gotten to the point, Sam, where we were talking about uh, your move to Duke and the fascinating circumstances under which that took place and I'm going to ask Ray to carry us from there. Dr. Cook, share with us your memory of the campus community climate of those uh, mid to late 60s years. Um, I was intrigued last night by your reference to the first uh, class of African American undergraduates with whom you interacted and so on. So share with us your memory of the climate in those years. Well, in terms of blacks, the so number is very small, 15 and 16 black undergraduates. Kind of staff, you didn't have any, even black secretary. There's one possible exception, and that was in the Divinity School. I'm not exactly sure when that secretary arrived, but it was only the black secretary in the whole university, and so forth. And of course, black faculty didn't have didn't have any uh, when I when I first arrived. 
But in terms of um, the, the friendliness to me, uh, people on the whole, very, very friendly, very outgoing. Uh, I was welcome uh, uh, into this community, in large part thanks to John Hallowell, my departmental chair, uh, and, and his wife. As a matter of fact, when we first arrived here, the uh, first uh, two or three nights were spent in, of all places, Hope Valley, <laughs> where John <laughs> and Silent lived. But I suppose the, 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 the most, uh, as I reflect on my experiences uh, at Duke when I first arrived, the most heartwarming thing uh, was the students. Uh, they welcomed me with, 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 with open arms. And ironically, I met a couple of students, uh, I guess uh, before, as my wife and I were driving up to Durham, uh, we stopped at some place down near Charlotte uh, to get some gas, and I saw two students had a Duke uh, decaf. So I said, look, uh, when I want to get to Durham, I said, I'm going up to Duke, so when we get to Durham, I said, uh, how do you get to Duke? They told them where to get off, you know, 85, as it turned out, both of them were in my class. <laughs> and I remember them, one Bobby Rosenthal, who ironically is a, a realtor in Baton Rouge. And the other one is a lawyer in Lafayette, Louisiana, both of them from Louisiana mm -hmm. and so forth. But when I, uh, I should never forget, to, John Hallowell uh, said to me, uh, Sam, you, you want me to go to class with you? Uh, first day, I said, no, I don't need you. I said, the students and I are going to get along just fine, no problem. So I went to class, and I sat in the back of the class. I got there early, as I always try to do. I sat in the back of the class. And then about 8 o'clock class in the social science building. And then about one minute of 8. I got up and started talking, and it just blew their minds <laughs> and so forth. It's, it was, <laughs> that's the, so they had not anticipated a black face uh, uh, there and so forth. But uh, the karma was just just fine for me and the whole. I, I got no, for the most part, negative uh, negative reaction, <coughs> except for uh, at least from the. Uh, at least from the students. I understand, though, and this is a part of the climate. Uh, when I had a trustee meeting, the issue of my presence came up. Mm -hmm. Trustee meeting. Should I mention? Yeah, but should I mention that now, or should I wait till something else? Why don't go ahead? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one trustee got up and said, uh, "I understand you have a Negro." Uh, on the faculty in political science, uh, uh, what's he doing here? And Wright Tisdale, who was chairman of the board, uh, got up, I mean, uh, said, look, I think I better say something. My son, Boyd is in Dr. Cook's class. And Boyd uh, said, Dr. Cook's an outstanding professor, and so forth. Uh, I said, fine. And then another trustee got up and said, look, I'd better say something. My granddaughter's in Dr. Cook's class. And she <laughs> said that, <laughs> that he's the best professor she's had at Duke. Mm -hmm. Now, and so it's, you know, tied mm -hmm. out that way. Now, what would have happened had Boyd Tisdale disliked me rather than liked me mm -hmm. and told his father, mm -hmm. who was chairman of the board, what would have happened to him? Or this other trustee's granddaughter, suppose she would have disliked me. Yes. So what it would have been, you know, since it allowed the teacher and this, that, no. You know, what would have happened? Mm -hmm. This is one of the, you know, the quirks of fate and so forth. But it did come up. And uh, frankly, Dr. Well, Dr. Dr. Knight was upset over it too. Upset about? Oh, yes, it came out. Uh, um, he was concerned about my presence here, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Was that a time 
uh, 67, 68, when um, there was a little more activism from the um, African American students and their allies leading uh, up to the assassination and then the vigil. But um, did anything foreshadow uh, the kind of outpouring of, 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 of uh, protest that surrounded uh, uh, the vigil and then questions about having more African American faculty, having black studies, that sort of thing? No, up until uh, um, 68, the vigil, mm -hmm. there was no activism, really, uh -huh. and so forth. Now, the um, African American students were concerned with a number of things, social life. Mm -hmm. They were concerned about the dances, they wanted a separate dormitory, a separate wing, a separate wing of the dormitory. But this was a, a conversation mm -hmm. and expression of what, what, you know, what, what they wanted. They were dissatisfied. And they had a black student union, they called it, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, which was which met, I think, on, a, on a, perhaps a weekly basis, I guess, to provide the, you know, support and so forth. And I remember Steph McLeod and others, uh, said they wanted me to identify more closely with the, you know, with the group mm -hmm. and so forth, and fine, of course, it's sure, that my support, mm -hmm. of course. But there was no, uh, there was nothing uh, to prepare us for the vigil. We could not have anticipated that at, at Duke. Though uh, people had been, uh, in terms of Local 77 and its recognition, that mm -hmm. had, had been mm -hmm. uh, some movement there, mm -hmm. a lot of talk about that. And we had a few demonstrations in favor of the, of the union. Uh, the union had not been recognized. In fact, that's one of the issues, the recognition of Local 77. Uh, so you had some activism on that level, but not in terms of any real organized and sustained effort in terms of, in terms of black. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John Sell and others last night referred to your, um, your uh, speech at the vigil. Um, w what is your memory of of the vigil, and uh, uh, share with us your your response to the assassination? Uh, now that we know about your interaction with Martin uh, at Morehouse, uh, the, the vigil was one of the really great moments, great experiences of my life. I think I go to my grave with memory of that vigil. It was one of those mountaintop experiences, exhilarating. Uh, in fact, I, I said uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, that the, the, the vigil was one of those moments in which the word was made flesh, mm -hmm. just that real in existential terms. I had never seen anything like it, never heard anything like it. In terms of my own reaction to the assassination, I, I must confess it was the closest I've ever come to bitterness. I was really upset with it. And I said uh, when, I, when I was called by the Chronicle, I said, every white racist had his hand on that trigger. And this upset some of my colleagues. They said they were surprised at me. I said, this is the way I feel. Um, John Cranch, remember Cranch? Mm -hmm. Fred, Fred Cranch. Fred Cranch, yeah. yeah. He lived two doors from us. Uh, called me. He said, well, we got to get to, we got to get together and do something in terms of Martin Luther King. And I said, Fred, let me tell you one thing. I said, white races kill my machine. I'm going to let you folks do something now. I said, I'm going to Atlanta to see ML's parents. I'm catching the plane the next hour. I was really upset with that question. When I got back, we got back that, uh, I guess, a Sunday. I had a, a note that said, come to the quad and bring some groceries. 
soft drinks, this, that, and other stuff. So, uh, I thought about it. And I told my wife, I said, let's, 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 oh, no, I don't, I will go over. Let's go to the grocery store and get some things. Went to the grocery store and got some items. And I said, I'm going to take them over to the court. I turned down campus drive. And I looked up there. I think one of the most glorious sights in the whole world, all these people out there. And I was just deeply moved by it. So I gave the food and drink to somebody. And of course, I joined them and so forth. It was just, just inspiring, this, this young lady. And to see these the youngsters, overwhelmingly white, uh, from the small towns and hamlets of Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, as well as elsewhere. But still from this town, out there on the quad, was just an inspiring and noble experience. And the longer they stayed out there, I understand, the, and you know, more participants uh, there were. And here they were in all that dignity singing the song. It was just, 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 just glorious. And that, in large part, saved me from bitterness. After I saw that, I said, there's hope in the world. So I could talk about the beloved community mm -hmm. at the vigil after I came back from Martin Luther King Jr.'s funeral. But the vigil, I said, it was so special. It was, I never, never forget it. One of the phrases you used in your speech that day was that seeing those 2,000 students there were roses for your soul. Yeah. Was that a phrase? That, that's a wonderful phrase. Tell us about how you came to that. Yeah, I, you know, you, you never know what you, how you come with these things. You, I'm sure somewhere along the line I'd heard roses, this and the other, uh, like wipe away tears and stuff. I juxtapose those, those two things and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, just one of those things where you struggle and it comes out, comes out right, and you, you reach back in your mind and, and so forth. I don't remember where I got the phrase and so forth, but uh, I know it came to me that day. And uh, it's, it's interesting you would say that because uh, um, what in '68 and '88 when they had the celebration, I guess it was. Uh, someone wrote an article entitled "Roses," uh, so something like that, and so mm -hmm. forth. Someone mentioned it yesterday, and so forth. Because you know that's one of the lucky thing that just come out right, and so forth. It's not luck, Sam. <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. But it was it was inspiring to stand there and, and talk after I got back. Uh, from Emil's funeral, and uh, it, it got so go good, the visit got so good one while they had Wright Tishdale come out there to speak to the girl. And while out there, I started singing, We Shall Overcome, and Wright Tishdale joined them, so you got the pitch in the chronicle. You know. <laughs> it, was, it was a great moment. Okay. Great moment. What followed the visual? Um, that we've heard a lot about was a period of increasing um, activism uh, on campus uh, and in the community. Uh, do you have memories of any of the people who were community connected like uh, Howard Fuller uh, uh, who was very much involved in uh, uh, some of the union uh, organizing uh, campaigns, uh, community-based uh, 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 leader in Durham. I wonder if, if, uh, if leading up to the Allen Building takeover, if there were any things happening, like in in '69, that you you were involved in. Well, you know, in terms of the the vision itself, that. The uh, aftermath was uh, uh, tremendous. I mean, the seed, seeds have been planted at sure. the time. And I remember the demand on President Knight at the time mm 
they didn't go away. Uh, they simmered. As I recall, there were, what, four. Uh, one was that the president would sign an advertisement in the Durham Harrow, advocating a day of mourning and identifying with the goals of Dr. King. Mm -hmm. Another one was that he resigned from the Hope Valley Country Club mm -hmm. uh, because it was not only segregated, but it was exclusive. It would not admit not only blacks, but Jews to membership. Mm -hmm. uh, the third one was the increase in the minimum wage from what, 115 to 160. Could you imagine uh, Duke with all this money exporting workers like that? And the fourth one was that the president appointed a committee consisting of students and faculty and staff to explore the possibilities of collective bargaining. Didn't demand the recognition of the union, uh, but it was. So these issues summoned because they were not addressed <coughs> and so forth. Uh, and you had uh, activism on all these issues. And clearly, I think, the, the president uh, was somewhat paralyzed after that. As a matter of fact, during the vigil, he got sick and was uh, out of action for quite some time. And Ara Taylor Cole, who was the provost, mm -hmm. uh, took over and so forth. Uh, but uh, he, after that, he was, I think, for the most part, ineffective. And it was clear that he, he was going to resign pretty soon. So. When did you decide to go to Ford? At what point did that happen? Did that happen in 69, 70? 69. 69. Uh, 69. Uh, I got the call from uh, Jim Arms of the Ford Foundation uh, that Ford wanted me, wanted to talk to me about. I wasn't interested in going to Ford Foundation. I was interested in teaching. Uh, then uh, Bundy called me about it. And I talked to Dr. Mays and some others about it uh, when I, uh, you know, developed some interest. And Dr. Mays said, well, said, uh, you can go up there and so forth and uh, you can have an impact. So go up there and be Sam Cook, speak your mind. And if you do that, you can make a contribution. So go up there and be an advocate the way you can do. So I thought about it, and then I went up and, and talked to Bundy. And I said to Mike George Bundy, uh, Mr. Bundy, how long would the Ford Foundation be interested in and go the Negro problem? You tell me, you, you mentioned your report. This is the nation's highest priority. And he said that. Solving the Negro problem. How long would you be interested? As a foundation, have a record and a reputation for short range interest. And without hesitating, Mike George Bundy said, uh, as long as there is a Negro problem, so the Ford Foundation is committed to it. So not only am I committed, but the board is. And say, Henry Ford himself. I guess the grandson of the fountain isn't interested and so forth. So I decided to explore possibilities there. I got a leave for one year, and then I got a second leave. Uh, so I was there for two years right. before, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Shortly after your arrival at Ford, uh, Duke uh, submitted an application for an interdisciplinary program in Afro-American studies. Um, I think that was an opportune moment uh, did did that initiative um, uh, cross your desk in any way, or? Uh, yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, it did, and I was very honest and open at Ford Foundation, and I told them. I told the vice president that Duke had a good program in the making, and I thought, well, let's make a grant to, to Duke University. And I talked to some people and, and so forth. And that. But 
I was very open about it, yes. Mm -hmm. It did cross my desk. I was yeah. very enthusiastic about it. Right. Because I, I thought Duke had the potential to my program because I, I knew Duke needed it, and I knew Duke would have a quality program. So, right. Yeah. Right. And by the time you returned from, uh, from the Ford Foundation, were you, were you satisfied with what you saw uh, at uh, implementing that initiative? Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, no, I, I wasn't satisfied. Uh, uh, that's been one of the disappointing things about Duke, the Afro-American Studies Program. Uh, and I raised this issue when I was on the Board of Trustees as an active member uh, of the system. It had languished in the background. It was not one of Duke's priorities, uh, sad to say. Um, this just went on and on mm -hmm. without leadership, without content, and so forth. Uh, but I must confess uh, that I am delighted by subsequent development. Yes. I, I think the appointment of uh, uh, Dr. Holloway is uh, great. He's very able, very committed, highly respected, and so forth. And uh, I'm sure now the program is going to take off after all these years, uh, 30 years. And I know it had the support of the president, the mm -hmm. provost, and the dean. Yes. I know the dean is behind it. <laughs> so I'm really optimistic for the first time. And I, I, I worked on the initial, I was on the initial committee in 69 and so forth. I've been following it. So for the first time, I feel good about the program. Right. Yeah. Sam, I'm going to sort of uh, intervene here a little bit because I, we, we want to spend some time with you talking about your 23 years as president. Mm -hmm. uh, and that we have a, not a whole lot of time to do that, but I, it, it must have been a great challenge for you to take on that kind of responsibility, uh, 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 ex leading a major university, uh, knowing you're not leaving completely the teaching profession, but nevertheless moving into an era of challenge. Can you tell us about how that, how that happened and, and what your strongest feelings are about your presidency? Oh, that's, uh, that's difficult. To, I never wanted to be an administrator. I, you know, I love teaching. And I have a sense of divine vocation. I think the Lord sent me into this world to teach. I enjoy it so much. I can hardly wait to get to class. I, you know, I love my students. When Dillard called me about the presidency, I told him I'm not interested. I called again in a couple of months, and I told him, I said, look, I'm not interested. He said, you come down and so forth. And I said, look, no point in wasting my time and yours. I'm not interested. I want to teach. This fascinated them. What I didn't know is that my saying no <laughs> <laughs> intensified the interest. The man who doesn't want, that's the man we want. <laughs> so they started, they said another. And then they said, uh, just let us come and tell you about Dillard. And I agreed then. This was three months later. So they came up to my office, the chairman of the board and the vice chairman. Talked to me about it, and I was impressed by the facilities, by the integrity of the president of the board and the vice president, the uh, president. But still, I said no. And so it just took another month or four. Uh, then they invited me to come down, just look at the campus. So I went down and took a look at the campus, met with faculty members and so forth. And I walked across that beautiful campus, you know, because you've been there, mm -hmm. early than one morning. I had a flashback. I saw none other than Benjamin Elijah Mays walking across the campus at Mohawk in a hurry, going to his office. I saw Benny May just as clear. And I said, you know, if I can do one twentieth with the students at Dillard, what Dr. May did for us at Mohawk, then I know my life would not be in vain. When I came back to, to Duke, uh, my wife said I was different. And Dr. May said I talked different. 
I said to Dr. May, Dr. May, you tricked me. <laughs> 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 you tricked me to this presidency and so forth. And when I explained, I saw that picture of him. And that's when I, that's when I decided. And my first honorary degree, of course, was to Dr. May. He's my first commencement speaker and this, that, and the other. But I, I said, uh, I thought I would miss teaching a great deal. I really didn't, because I didn't have time. In addition to which, uh, a president is a teacher. Sometimes, sometimes he has to teach the board of trustees, other faculty, <laughs> you know, alumni and so forth. Got to, got to teach them and so forth. So I, so I never missed uh, the classroom per se. I had a wider audience and so forth. And as president, I could do something. I could dream and I could make things happen. I could nurture young faculty members. This was one of the great joys. I could, uh, uh, with the help of others, of course, establish programs that I thought would be exciting for students. And we developed the University Scholars Program, the President's Scholars Program, to attract top flight students. One year, a student turned down 14 scholarships, most of the Ivy League schools, to come to Dillard to be a University Scholar. We could develop a program like uh, the Japanese Studies uh, program and so forth. Oh, of course, one of my pets, the um, National Center for, Center for Black Jewish Relations. Mm -hmm. All those things became very meaningful to me and, and, and very, very, very exciting. But to deal with these young people, to try to inspire them, to try to project a vision, <coughs> uh, you know, a president, just like a teacher, the greatest thing a teacher can give a student. Not a whole set of facts, this, that, that, but his vision of life, his vision of the higher possibilities, the intellectual life. Project that vision. And let students buy into it, let them wrestle with it. They don't have to accept it, but let them wrestle with it. Let it, let it flow through the currents of their lives. And that's what a president can do for the whole institution, students, faculty, and what have you. So while I didn't teach in the classes, I mm -hmm. had a lot of contact with students. We lived on campus. They felt free to come by, though they used a lot of sense, they didn't come by all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's, 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 a, that's, that's a real job. So development of programs, go out and try to raise some money to, uh, you know, to help them. Uh, discuss ideas and so forth. This is great joy, mm -hmm. being president, yeah. Do you miss it? No, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I'm glad after that long tenure, and I was blessed, <coughs> uh, you know, with good health all the while I was there. I wanted to retire at the top of my game when I was in good health. I didn't want them to drag me out, <laughs> you know, feet first, or this, that, and the other, I'll stay there until my health was broken. So I want to get out. You know, there, there's one, one last set of questions I think we'd like to ask you in the last five minutes of this interview. We, you talked earlier about your wonderful wife and the way in which she responded to the Atlanta University president and the move and all that. Will you tell us a little bit about your thoughts about your family and, 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 and what you've been through together over the years? Well, that's the most blessed uh, of all the experiences, the supportive, the nurturing environment of my family. You need that nurturing support, uh, that inner network, and so forth. And I've had the love of my wife and my and my family uh, throughout this whole period. Uh, my wife since we married in 1960, and, and of course my kids uh, uh, later. And I tried to avoid letting the presidency get in the way of my family life. When I was away, and I was away a great deal, you know, a person had to travel a great deal. I called home while I was in this country every day and talked to my wife, talked to my son, and talked to my daughter. And each time I always end, I, I love you, and so forth. So, you know, my being away was somewhat mitigated by the constant communion. I had with my family and my kids. 
I was especially concerned with my kids, you know, my being away a great deal, and I've heard so many stories about that and so forth. Uh, and the other thing, he don't care about me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to reassure my kids on a daily basis. So they knew if I were in, in California or New York or Durham or what have you, Dad was going to call that night before bedtime at 10 o'clock or what have you. Uh, but the some love and support I've had uh, my wife and my kids has been redemptive and inspiring. And I've tried to return that love. Well, you have returned that love to them and to us. Uh, and you have made a tremendous difference to this university uh, by your leadership and your engagement and your commitment. We thank you for being part of this interview so we can have a chance to hear from you what have been the experiences in your life that have made it possible for you to be such a terrific person for us all. So thank you. Thank you so much.